All right, welcome back, folks. We're talking about the social implications of computing, and today's topic is computing enables innovation. So the point is, you probably have seen this, you probably know this, this is more raw, raw computing conversations, but many people may not know all the things computing does for all the fields. This is a CS plus X kind of topic where computing plus another field affects that field significantly, wherever X happens to be. So, Machine learning and data mining. So on the right, you see two massive machines, two massive clusters of machines. We often call those a server, which is, I'm, this is you don't have to memorize this, this is just a name, a server, which is kind of like a pizza pie box. Okay, that's a server, it's probably big, really big, okay? It's called usually a one use server. Then there's a rack, which is a huge set of maybe 40 of these together, okay? And you can kind of see that you can kind of see that in the, the picture of Titan and down there uh, in a Titan is the lower one and Watson is the upper one. And then you have this kind of big thing. It's kind of like a big, tall monolith. And then you put a grid of them together and that's an array. So server, rack, as I say rack, rack is the big guy and then array is a lot of racks, okay? So right there are two supercomputers and there's um, both huge arrays of those. It's a lot of machines. IBM Watson became famous uh, you, uh, there was reading for IBM Watson for this class. I'm sure you saw that. That's a New York Times article on that. That talked about how IBM Watson, the program and the software they wrote, was able to play Jeopardy better, better than the best humans, which is pretty amazing in terms of an AI breakthrough. That was a very hard, th believably, believed to be an unsolvable problem, and they did it. It was like, wow, Watson is amazing, okay? So think about, now what it's doing is it's grabbing data in, it's grabbing the, it's basically downloaded a copy of the World Wide Web and then did some processing on it to make it fast access. And so that, in some sense, is data mining. I have all this data and I'm mining it for where the answers are and what the kind of key results I'm looking for. That's what mining is. A massive set of data and you have to like mine your way through via search and via big data techniques. We'll talk about more about data in this course later. So machine learning is where, you saw this in the AI discussion, Machine learning is the machine has takes an input, either formal training or informal training. Um, it is getting better. The, whatever the machine was doing is, has improved based on lots of data. That's what machine learning is doing. So think about medicine. So IBM Watson did this big splash where they beat the Jeopardy champion, but what's their second act? You know, what's, their, what's their next thing they're going to do? Well, they decided to go into medicine, in which they are ingesting all the recommendations. When someone comes in sick, what's the recommendation? You say, this person is presenting with you know, a cold, a, a this, a that, a this, a fever, blah, blah, blah. And the, IBM Watson says, I think it's this. I would recommend these things to do. Or, a, or these questions to ask, to follow up. So this is now being used, the, the, what IBM's, in IBM's PR literature, it's being used by, um, recommendations by the IBM Watson are being used by 90% of the nurses in the select pilot they're using it with. It's amazing, okay? So Watson is really improving healthcare, and that's awesome. Um, business, people have been mining your credit card receipts for years. My uncle worked at Visa years ago, and he would download unbelievable amounts of data and then try to figure out, you know, when people buy this, what do they buy next? That's kind of the recommendation. So what, what should they, supermarkets do this as well. What do they put next to each other in the aisle? What are the, what are the impulse purchases? They're completely data mining what you're buying and what you want and then charging people more for sh shelf space based on how hot they are, based on the mining of their own purchases, all that. Business has been doing for years, as well as Amazon giving recommendation systems, Pandora, recommending songs for you. Netflix, the same kind of thing. So all this has been done by business for many, many years. And science. So I'm showing you Titan. Titan has been used for unbelievable things. We're going to have a lecture later in this course called Saving the World with Computers. And K Professor Kathy Yellick is going to talk about how it, big, massive arrays, massive clusters of workstations are used for climate simulation, for um, trying to simulate uh, a nuclear explosion without having to actually launch a bomb and have nuclear, you know, waste in our, in our environment. So all the things that you can do that are too dangerous or too fast or too slow, you can sim simulate these. And we're talking about simulations of a big idea. So that's the key thing. Machine learning, data mining are a big player in both business and science and medicine. Scientific computing, which is thinking about when you're doing programming, often you have integers where you just have counts of things. You don't have floating point values, which are real numbers like 8.6523 or pi. We had pi day recently, well, pi, okay? So the numbers that have fractional components are called real numbers, and numbers that don't have are called integers. So most of the programs we ever ask you to write are mostly integer work. But most of the real work that's done by scientists is real number work, and that's the scientific computing side. 
And they have worked on computers to be really, really amazingly fast. And most of those algorithms, algorithms are now parallel. And so those parallel algorithms, work, parallel algorithms work on the floating point problems rather than the integer problems, although there is a fair amount of integer problems as well. Computing enables innovation by providing the ability to access and share information. This is awesome. So now databases can be anywhere. My results can be, we talked about this last time, I think, where you can find the problems remotely, you can work on them collaboratively, and you can share those results. So computing help, helps with that as well. And here's another piece. One of the important things is open and curated scientific databases. So imagine all of the medical researchers are able to not just have their little study that they have in the local hospital, but com collaborate, collaboratively add it together to a shared database of all the patients presenting with the flu. And you add it all, the CDC put this all in one database. So imagine if each hospital can forward their data to one shared database, and you can learn that and mine from that where the flu is happening and what can we do about it. So all, being able to read and write to these shared databases is a really big deal as well. Okay? Moore's Law, we saw lectures on concurrency. So Moore's Law is the property that says that uh, roughly every two years, the number of transistors per chip doubles. And many things that track along with Moore's Law have been the single core performance of CPUs, um, the amount, the speed of, of memory, the, the capacity of disks. All those things have gone with exponential, exponential rates. Um, but what, it, what, what this bullet says is that Moore's Law has enabled industries, because they know their computers are getting faster and faster, and they've kind of hit a sea change where they've kind of peaked, but they're still going more and more parallel. So you're still having the performance curve go up exponentially. And because of that, the businesses are saying, well, we need to compute something new on this much larger data set, but computers aren't there yet. But what, guess what? There's a marching train of progress that's happening thanks to Moore's Law and thanks to the Intel and some of the wonderful engineers at these semiconductor companies. So because of that, they plan, this is the bullet says, they plan for future research and development based on where the computer's going to come. It's almost like a football pass. Here's the computer's coming, and here's where our R&D is going to be. So when we get to the point where we're going to need a terabyte of data and a petaflop of, of compute cycles, the computer's going to be there by the time we have our problems ready for them. So it's kind of cool. They plan for that based on where the trajectory that Moore's Law has predicted, which is nice. And I'm sure you know, we talked about creativity being, being supported by computing. Um, advances in computing and enabling technologies like parallel stuff, like these massive render farms uh, in this particular example, have increased the creativity. Not only have they increased the ability for everyone to participate, we talked about that also last time, but imagine the idea that Pixar can now render something that's almost unbelievably photorealistic in a way they couldn't have done 10 or 20 years ago because of the massive parallelism and because, and now they're able to share. You now have uh, DreamWorks for a while, which is another animation company, had two facilities, and they were able to seamlessly work together across these two facilities that were hundreds of miles apart in Northern California and Southern California because of computing, because of the virtual teleconferencing, sharing databases. They're basically working, acting as one company, even though they were hundreds of miles apart. So they've certainly supported the creativity and the ability to be able to work at distance. 